This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Chris Hughes, readear.blogspot.com. Youth, a Narrative by Joseph Conrad. Part 3. It was that night at ten that for the first time since we'd been fighting it we saw the fire. The speed of the towing had fanned the smouldering destruction. A blue gleam appeared forward, shining below the wreck of the deck. It wavered in patches. It seemed to stir and creep like the light of a glowworm. I saw it first and told Man. Then the game's up, he said. We'd better stop this towing or she'll burst out suddenly fore and aft before we can clear out. We set up a yell, rang bells to attract their attention. They towed on. At last, Man and I had to crawl forward and cut the rope with an axe. There was no time to cast off the lashings. Red tongues could be seen licking the wilderness of splinters under our feet as we made our way back to the poop. Of course, they very soon found out in the steamer that the rope was gone. She gave a loud blast of her whistle. Her lights were seen sweeping in a wide circle. She came up ranging close alongside and stopped. We were all in a tight group on the poop looking at her. Every man had saved a little bundle or a bag. Suddenly, a conical flame with a twisted top shot up forward and threw upon the black sea a circle of light, with two vessels side by side and heaving gently in its centre. Captain Beard had been sitting on the grating still and mute for hours, but now he rose slowly and advanced in front of us to the mizzen shrouds. Captain Nash hailed. Come along, look sharp. I have mailbags on board. I'll take you and your boats to Singapore. Thank you, no, said our skipper. We must see the last of the ship. I can't stand by any longer, shouted the other. Mails, you know. Aye, aye, we're all right. Very well. I'll report you in Singapore. Good-bye. He waved his hand. Our men dropped their bundles quietly. The steamer moved ahead and passed out of the circle of light, vanished at once from our sight, dazzled by the fire which burned fiercely. And then I knew that I would see the East first as commander of a small boat. I thought it fine, and the fidelity to the old ship was fine. We should see the last of her. Oh, the glamour of youth! Oh, the fire of it! More dazzling than the flames of the burning ship, throwing a magic light on the wide earth, leaping audaciously to the sky, presently to be quenched by time, more cruel, more pitiless, more bitter than the sea, and like the flames of the burning ship surrounded by an impenetrable night. The old man warned us in his gentle and inflexible way that it was part of our duty to save for the underwriters as much as we could of the ship's gear. According, we went to work aft, while she blazed forward, to give us plenty of light. We lugged out a lot of rubbish. What didn't we save? An old barometer fixed with an absurd quantity of screws nearly cost me my life. A sudden rush of smoke came upon me, and I just got away in time. There were various stores, bolts of canvas, coils of rope. The poop looked like a marine bazaar, and the boats were lumbered to the gunwales. One would have thought the old man wanted to take as much as he could of his first command with him. He was very, very quiet, but off his balance, evidently. Would you believe it? He wanted to take a length of old steam cable and kedge anchor with him, in the longboat. We said, aye, aye, sir, deferentially, and on the quiet let the things slip overboard. The heavy medicine chest went that way, two bags of green coffee, tins of paint, fancy paint, a whole lot of things. Then I was ordered with two hands into the boats to make a stowage and get them ready against the time it would be proper for us to leave the ship. We put everything straight stepped the longboat's mast for our skipper, who was in charge of her, and I was not sorry to sit down for a moment. My face felt raw, every limb ached as if broken. I was aware of all my ribs and would have sworn to a twist in the backbone. The boat's fast astern lay in a deep shadow, and all around I could see the circle of the sea lighted by the fire. A gigantic flame arose forward, straight and clear. It flared there, with noises like the whir of wings, with rumbles as of thunder. There were cracks, detonations, and from the cone of flame the sparks flew upward, as man is born to trouble, to leaky ships, and to ships that burn. 
What bothered me was that the ship, lying broadside to the swell and to such wind as there was, a mere breath, the boats would not keep astern where they were safe, but persisted, in a pig-headed way boats have, in getting under the counter and then swinging alongside. They were knocking about dangerously and coming near the flame while the ship rolled on them, and of course there was always the danger of the masts going over the side at any moment. I and my two boat-keepers kept them off as best we could with oars and boat-hooks, but to be constantly at it became exasperating, since there was no reason why we should not leave at once. We could not see those on board, nor could we imagine what caused the delay. The boat-keepers were swearing feebly, and I had not only my share of the work, but also had to keep at it two men who showed a constant inclination to lay themselves down and let things slide. At last I hailed, "'On deck there!' and someone looked over. "'We're ready here,' I said. The head disappeared, and very soon popped up again. "'The captain says all right, sir, and to keep the boats well clear of the ship.' Half an hour passed. Suddenly there was a frightful racket, rattle, clanking of chain, hiss of water, and millions of sparks flew up into the shivering column of smoke that stood leaning slightly above the ship. The catheads had burned away and the two red-hot anchors had gone to the bottom, tearing off after them two hundred fathom of red-hot chain. The ship trembled, the mass of flame swayed as if ready to collapse, and the fore top-gallant mast fell. It darted down like an arrow of fire, shot under, and instantly leaped up within an oar's length of the boats, floated quietly, very black on the luminous sea. I hailed the deck again. After some time a man, in an unexpectedly cheerful but also muffled tone, as though he had been trying to speak with his mouth shut, informed me, "'Coming directly, sir!' and vanished. For a long time I heard nothing but the whir and roar of the fire. There were also whistling sounds. The boats jumped, tugged at the painters, ran at each other playfully, knocked their sides together, or, do what we would, swung in a bunch against the ship's side. I couldn't stand it any longer and swarming up a rope, clambered aboard over the stern. It was as bright as day. Coming up like this, the sheet of fire facing me was a terrifying sight, and the heat seemed hardly bearable at first. On a settee cushion, dragged out of the cabin, Captain Beard, with his legs drawn up and one arm over his head, slept, with a light playing on him. Do you know what the rest were busy about? They were sitting on deck, right aft, round an open case, eating bread and cheese and drinking bottled stout. On the background of flames, twisting in fierce tongues above their heads, they seemed at home like salamanders, and looked like a band of desperate pirates. The fire sparkled in the whites of their eyes, gleamed on patches of white skin seen through the torn shirts. Each had the marks as of a battle around him, bandaged heads, tied-up arms, a strip of dirty rag round a knee and each man had a bottle between his legs and a chunk of cheese in his hand. Man got up. With his handsome and disreputable head, his hooked profile, his long white beard, and with an uncorked bottle in his hand, he resembled one of those reckless sea-robbers of old, making merry amidst violence and disaster. "'The last meal on board,' he explained solemnly. "'We had nothing to eat all day, and it was no use leaving all this.' He flourished the bottle and indicated the sleeping skipper. He said he couldn't swallow anything, so I got him to lie down, he went on, and as I stared, I don't know whether you're aware, young fellow, the man had no sleep to speak of for days, and there'll be damn little sleep in the boats. There will be no boats by and by if you fool about much longer, I said, indignantly. I walked up to the skipper and shook him by the shoulder. At last he opened his eyes, but did not move. Time to leave her, sir, I said quietly. He got up painfully, looked at the flames, as the sea sparkling round the ship, and black, black as ink farther away, he looked at the stars shining dim through a thin veil of smoke in a sky black, black as Erebus. Youngest first, he said. And the ordinary seaman, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, got up, clambered over the taffrail, and vanished. Others followed. One, on the point of going over, stopped short to drain his bottle, and with a great swing of his arm flung it at the fire. "'Take this!' he cried. The skipper lingered disconsolately, and we left him to commune alone for a while with his first command. Then I went up again and brought him away at last. It was time. The ironwork on the poop was hot to the touch. Then the painter of the longboat was cut, and the three boats, tied together, drifted clear of the ship. 
It was just sixteen hours after the explosion when we abandoned her. Man had charge of the second boat, and I had the smallest, the fourteen-foot thing. The longboat would have taken the lot of us, but the skipper said we must save as much property as we could, for the underwriters, and so I got my first command. I had two men with me, a bag of biscuits, a few tins of meat, and a breaker of water. I was ordered to keep close to the longboat, that in case of bad weather we might be taken into her. And you know what I thought? I thought I would part company as soon as I could. I wanted to have my first command all to myself. I wasn't going to sail in a squadron if there were a chance for independent cruising. I would make land by myself. I would beat the other boats. Youth. All youth. The silly, charming, beautiful youth. But we did not make a start at once. We must see the last of the ship. And so the boats drifted about that night, heaving and setting on the swell. The men dozed, waked, sighed, groaned. I looked at the burning ship. Between the darkness of earth and heaven, she was burning fiercely upon a disk of purple sea, shot by the blood-red play of gleams, upon a disk of water glittering and sinister. A high, clear flame, an immense and lonely flame, ascended from the ocean and from its summit the black smoke poured continuously at the sky. She burned furiously, mournful and imposing like a funeral pile kindled in the night, surrounded by the sea, watched over by the stars. A magnificent death had come like a grace, like a gift, like a reward to that old ship at the end of her laborious days. The surrender of her weary ghost to the keeping of the stars and sea was stirring like the sight of a glorious triumph. The masts fell, just before daybreak, and for a moment there was a burst and turmoil of sparks that seemed to fill with flying fire the night patient and watchful, the vast night lying silent upon the sea. At daylight she was only a charred shell, floating still under a cloud of smoke and bearing a glowing mass of coal within. Then the oars were got out, and the boats forming in a line moved round her remains as if in procession, the longboat leading. As we pulled across her stern, a slim dart of fire shot out viciously at us, and suddenly she went down, head first, in a great hiss of steam. The unconsumed stern was the last to sink, but the paint had gone, had cracked, had peeled off, and there were no letters. There was no word, no stubborn device that was like her soul to flash at the rising sun her creed and her name. We made our way north. A breeze sprang up, and about noon all the boats came together for the last time. I had no mast or sail in mine, but I made a mast out of a spare oar and hoisted a boat awning for a sail, with a boat hook for a yard. She was certainly overmastered, but I had the satisfaction of knowing that with the wind aft I could beat the other two. I had to wait for them. Then we all had a look at the captain's chart, and after a sociable meal of hard bread and water, got our last instructions. These were simple. Steer north, and keep together as much as possible. "'Be careful with that jury-rig, Marlow,' said the captain. And man, as I sailed proudly past his boat, wrinkled his curved nose and hailed, You'll sail that ship of yours under water if you don't look out, young fellow. He was a malicious old man. And may the deep sea where he sleeps now rock him gently, rock him tenderly to the end of time. Before sunset, a thick rain squall passed over the two boats, which were far astern, and that was the last I saw of them for a time. Next day I sat steering my cockle shell, my first command, with nothing but water and sky around me. I did sight in the afternoon the upper sails of a ship far away, but said nothing, and my men did not notice her. You see, I was afraid she might be homeward bound, and I had no mind to turn back from the portals of the east. I was steering for Java, another blessed name, like Bangkok, you know. I steered many days. I need not tell you what it is to be knocking about in an open boat. I remember nights and days of calm when we pulled, we pulled, and the boat seemed to stand still, as if bewitched within the circle of the sea horizon. I remember the heat, the deluge of rain squalls that kept us bailing for dear life, but filled our water cask, 
and I remember sixteen hours on end, with a mouth dry as a cinder, and a steering oar over the stern to keep my first command head on to a breaking sea. I did not know how good a man I was till then. I remember the drawn faces, the dejected figures of my two men, and I remember my youth, and the feeling that will never come back any more, the feeling that I could last for ever, outlast the sea, the earth, and all men. The deceitful feeling that lures us on to joys, to perils, to love, to vain effort, to death. The triumphant conviction of strength, the heat of life in the handful of dust, the glow in the heart that with every year grows dim, grows cold, grows small, and expires. And expires too soon before life itself. And this is how I see the East. I have seen its secret places, and have looked into its very soul, but now I see it always from a small boat, a high outline of mountains, blue and afar in the morning, like faint mist at noon, a jagged wall of purple at sunset. I had the feel of the oar in my hand, the vision of a scorching blue sea in my eyes, and I see a bay, a wide bay, smooth as glass and polished like ice, shimmering in the dark. A red light burns far off upon the gloom of the land, and the night is soft and warm. We drag at the oars with aching arms, and suddenly a puff of wind, a puff faint and tepid and laden with strange odours of blossoms, of aromatic wood, comes out of the still night, the first sigh of the east upon my face. That I can never forget. It was impalpable and enslaving, like a charm, like a whispered promise of mysterious delight. We had been pulling this finishing spell for eleven hours. Two pulled, and he whose turn it was to rest sat at the tiller. <clears throat> we had made out the red light in that bay and steered for it, guessing it must mark some small coasting port. We passed two vessels, outlandish and high-sterned, sleeping at anchor, and approaching the light, now very dim, ran the boat's nose against the end of a jutting wharf. We were blind with fatigue. My men dropped the oars and fell off the thwarts as if dead. I made fast to a pile. A current rippled softly. The scented obscurity of the shore was grouped into vast masses, a density of colossal clumps of vegetation, probably, mute and fantastic shapes, and at their foot the semicircle of a beach gleamed faintly like an illusion. There was not a light, not a stir, not a sound. The mysterious east faced me, perfumed like a flower, silent like death, dark like a grave. And I sat weary beyond expression, exulting like a conqueror, sleepless and entranced as if before a profound, a fateful enigma. A splashing of oars, a measured dip reverberating on the level of water, intensified by the silence of the shore into loud claps, made me jump up. A boat, a European boat, was coming in. I invoked the name of the dead. I hailed, Judea ahoy! A thin shout answered. It was the captain. I had beaten the flagship by three hours, and I was glad to hear the old man's voice, tremulous and tired. Is it you, Marlow? Mind the end of that jetty, sir, I cried. He approached cautiously, and brought up with the deep-sea lead line which we had saved for the underwriters. I eased my painter and fell alongside. He sat, a broken figure at the stern, wet with dew, his hands clasped in his lap. His men were asleep already. I had a terrible time of it, he murmured. Man is behind. Not very far. We conversed in whispers, in low whispers, as if afraid to wake up the land. Guns, thunder, earthquakes would not have awakened the men just then. Looking around as we talked, I saw away at sea a bright light travelling in the night. There's a steamer passing the bay, I said. She was not passing, she was entering, and she even came close and anchored. I wish, said the old man, you would find out whether she is English. Perhaps they could give us a passage somewhere. He seemed nervously anxious. So, by dint of punching and kicking, I started one of my men into a state of somnambulism, and giving him an oar, took another, and pulled toward the lights of the steamer. 
There was a murmur of voices in her, metallic hollow clangs of the engine room, footsteps on the deck. Her ports shone, round like dilated eyes. Shapes moved about, and there was a shadowy man, high up on the bridge. He heard my oars. And then, before I could open my lips, the East spoke to me. But it was in a Western voice. A torrent of words was poured into the enigmatical, the fateful silence, outlandish, angry words, mixed with words and even whole sentences of good English, less strange, but even more surprising. The voice swore and cursed violently. It riddled the solemn peace of the bay by a volley of abuse. It began by calling me pig, and from that went crescendo into unmentionable adjectives in English. The man up there raged aloud in two languages, and with a sincerity in his fury that almost convinced me I had, in some way, sinned against the harmony of the universe. I could hardly see him, but began to think he would work himself into a fit. Suddenly he ceased, and I could hear him snorting and blowing like a porpoise. I said, "'What steamer is this, pray?' "'Eh, hey, what's that? And who are you?' Castaway crew of an English bark burnt at sea. We came here tonight. I am the second mate. The captain is in the longboat and wishes to know if you would give us a passage somewhere. Oh, my goodness! I say. This is the Celestial from Singapore on her return trip. I'll arrange with your captain in the morning. And I say, did you hear me just now? I should think the whole bay heard you. I thought you were a shoreboat. Now look here. This infernal lazy scoundrel of a caretaker has gone to sleep again. Curse him. The light is out, and I nearly ran foul at the end of this damn jetty. This is the third time he plays me this trick. Now I ask you, can anybody stand this kind of thing? It's enough to drive a man out of his mind. I'll report him. I'll get the assistant resident to give him the sack by... See, there's no light. It's out, isn't it? I take you to witness the light's out. There should be a light, you know. A red light on the... There was a light, I said mildly. But it's out, man. What's the use of talking like this? You can see for yourself it's out, don't you? If you had to take a valuable steamer on this godforsaken coast, you'd want a light too. I'll kick him from end to end of his miserable wharf. You see if I don't, I will. So I may tell my captain you'll take us? I broke in. Yes, I'll take you. Good night, he said brusquely. I pulled back, made fast again to the jetty, and then went to sleep at last. I had faced the silence of the East. I had heard some of its languages. But when I opened my eyes again, the silence was as complete as though it had never been broken. I was lying in a flood of light, and the sky had never looked so far, so high before. I opened my eyes and lay without moving. And then I saw the men of the East. They were looking at me. The whole length of the jetty was full of people. I saw brown, bronze, yellow faces, the black eyes, the glitter, the colour of an eastern crowd. And all these beings stared, without a murmur, without a sigh, without a movement. They stared down at the boats, at the sleeping men who at night had come to them from the sea. Nothing moved. The fronds of palms stood still against the sky. Not a branch stirred along the shore and the brown roofs of hidden houses peeped through the green foliage, through the big leaves that hung shining and still, like leaves forged of heavy metal. This was the east of the ancient navigators, so old, so mysterious, resplendent and sombre, living and unchanged, full of danger and promise. And these were the men. I sat up suddenly. A wave of movement passed through the crowd from end to end, passing along the heads, swayed the bodies, ran along the jetty like a ripple on the water, like a breath of wind on a field. And all was still again. I see it now, the wide sweep of the bay, the glittering sands, the wealth of green, infinite and varied, the sea blue like the sea of a dream, the crowd of attentive faces, the blaze of vivid colour, the water reflecting it all. The curve of the shore, the jetty, the high-sterned outlandish craft floating still, and the three boats with tired men from the west sleeping, unconscious of the land and the people and of the violence of sunshine. They slept thrown against the thwarts, 
curled on bottom boards in the careless attitudes of death. The head of the old skipper, leaning back in the stern of the longboat, had fallen on his breast, and he looked as though he would never wake. Farther out, old man's face was upturned to the sky, with a long white beard spread out on his breast, as though he had been shot where he sat at the tiller. And a man, all in a heap, in the bows of the boat, slept with both arms embracing the stem-head, and with his cheek laid on the gunwale. The east looked at them without a sound. I have known its fascination since. I have seen the mysterious shores, the still water, the lands of brown nations, where a stealthy nemesis lies in wait, pursues, overtakes so many of the conquering race who are proud of their wisdom, of their knowledge, of their strength. But for me, all the East is contained in that vision of my youth. It is all in that moment when I opened my young eyes on it. I came upon it from a tussle with the sea, and I was young, and I saw it looking at me. And this is all that is left of it, only a moment, a moment of strength, of romance, of glamour, of youth, a flicker of sunshine upon a strange shore, the time to remember, the time for a sigh, and good-bye, night, good-bye. He drank. Ah, the good old time, the good old time, youth and the sea, glamour and the sea, the good strong sea, the salt bitter sea that could whisper to you and roar at you and knock your breath out of you. He drank again. By all that's wonderful, it is the sea, I believe, the sea itself, or is it youth alone? Who can tell? But you here, you all had something out of life, money, love, whatever one gets on shore. And tell me, wasn't that the best time, that time when you were young at sea? young and had nothing, on the sea that gives nothing except hard knocks, and sometimes a chance to feel your strength, that only, what you all regret? And we all nodded at him, the man of finance, the man of accounts, the man of law. We all nodded at him over the polished table that like a still sheet of brown water reflected our faces, lined, wrinkled, our faces marked by toil, by deceptions, by success, by love, our weary eyes looking still, looking always, looking anxiously for something out of life that while it is expected is already gone, has passed unseen in a sigh, in a flash, together with the youth, with the strength, with the romance of illusions. End of Youth a narrative by Joseph Conrad.